I want to talk to you about the, um, the anatomy of overcoming. Because we're heading into territory uh, that's bigger than us. <clears throat> we're heading into an experience of the kingdom um, that I believe is truly massive. And one of the reasons I did that first session was just to say to us that <clears throat> the way in is the way through. The way into the bigness and the fullness of God is through all your life circumstances. Each circumstance is a door into a revelation, a truth, an experience, an encounter. You cannot ignore the lessons that are right there in your life. And that's the huge part of you growing up into all things in life. We don't make things an event, we make them a lifestyle. We're learning how to be in Christ, we're learning how to grow up in Christ, we're learning how to become like him, think like him, and so on. And all your life lessons are there in your life situations. So your life is your training ground. So all of us right now, we're in a variety of situations, and we are learning so many things about who God is and about who we are in Christ. And so I, I bless you in your life lesson learning. I've got some interesting life lessons of my own right now. I've got a couple that are really difficult and therefore quite fascinating to me because I expect to see something in majesty in Jesus that I've never seen before. And sometimes to me, the more difficult a situation is, the more God wants to give me. So that's my mindset. That's my lens. It's my language. I'm not going to be overcome because I am an overcomer. Yeah? <clears throat> Vital for us to experience both favor and vengeance in our life. According to Isaiah 61, you know, Jesus grants us favor and vengeance at the favor of God and vengeance over the enemy. There's a day of vengeance for all of us where we turn the tables on the enemy and we learn how to push him back. <clears throat> we learn how to overcome him and then we learn how to be more than a conqueror which takes place when he realizes he can't beat us and so there's no point because he can't afford the resources. He doesn't have the manpower. One third of the angels fell and became demons, so we still outnumber the suckers two to one. And we have the Father, and we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit, and we have one another. This is not a fair fight. This is a good fight. And a good fight is one that you don't lose, right? Because that would be a bad fight and God calls us to a winnable war he calls us to a good fight and so favor and vengeance coming into a place of favor in God gives you a capacity to overcome <clears throat> some of us have had some very difficult circumstances in our life and you know it's important for us to get revenge on the enemy to make him pay I like those days the purpose of warfare in the New Testament is so that we can know the king in all of his glory in all of his majesty so we can have encounters with that majesty the purpose of warfare in the New Testament is so we can experience the kingdom coming down and overlaying itself on the world where we live well, we can develop faith and favor. We can grow up in all things and become bigger. How many of you know that you're not supposed to be this size when you enter heaven? Your spirit is bigger than your physical frame. But well, we have to grow in spirit and in truth. It's so that you can take your identity to a new level. I love the fact that the world, it's interesting to me, the world is spiraling downwards. We're spiraling in the opposite direction. 
we're spiraling upwards we're learning how to go up into the estimations of God we're learning how to go up in our identity in our inheritance in our capacity to lead lives that represent Jesus and one of the major purposes of warfare in the New Testament is that you would truly understand your personal inheritance and the inheritance over your household and over your community that your community can come into an inheritance just because you live there that they come under what you live under joyfully that you can you can push it out to them you can spread that out it's just called the good news the glad tidings of great joy and we are proponents of goodness Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil I believe goodness has a nuclear power attached to it it's powerful and it's important that we're moving in the goodness of God not the hatred of the world Let me read you something from the Bible. Who's read Ephesians lately? What a cracking book, eh? Sheesh. There's enough stuff in there to keep you busy for the whole of your life. Let me read this. Ephesians 1 verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. You'll know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And that you'd know what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the strength and the working of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Biggest game changer ever. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, all power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 3:10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. I think that means we call the shots. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Can't leave Ephesians 6 out. Verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our flesh, it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stay standing. Oh yeah. Don't you love the Bible? You ever get that urge to kiss the Bible on days? When you read a scripture, you should kiss it. Because it's like, because I think God is kissing you when he reads scripture to you. Yeah? Yeah? making known to the enemy multiplied abundance of wisdom 
the mind and the ways of God <coughs> being revealed. I think it's so important for us to learn to take our eyes off the world and put them on the kingdom and come under that place of rule as a lifestyle not just when you need to but as a lifestyle so you never get caught out by situations majesty is a mindset it's a lifestyle it's a way of seeing and thinking and speaking 24-7 Do you ever wonder about the majesty that we could encounter in these days? I think about that all the time. Situations, you know, I, I, I wrote a book called Living in Dependency and Wonder because God took me through a three-year period of just learning how to live as a much-loved child, how to have that sense of wonder about everything not I wonder what God's going to do you know but having that sense of wonder because you know God you know what he's capable of and you know that he put Christ in you so that he could do it to you right so we shouldn't have a question about ourselves we shouldn't ever be thinking I don't deserve this you totally deserve this. Why? Because Jesus in you deserves it. And if he's in you, you deserve it. You can't separate the two. That's just double-mindedness. Oh, well, Jesus is wonderful, but I'm rubbish. No, you're not. You're in Christ. Everything that made you rubbish, he took it away and nailed it to a tree. He buried it in a grave. And when, he, when you rose again in newness of life, your old man did not rise with you. It's still down there. Don't visit the gravesite. You can't resurrect that corpse. You know, dealing with your old man is like exhuming a corpse and giving it plastic surgery. It's the dumbest thing ever. God is not going to change something that he's already killed. Big clue. God is not going to help you with your old man. He's already done the best thing for it. He killed it stone dead. Because nobody in heaven wanted the job of changing your old man. Because that's a futile existence. You're dead. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are so dead so dead stay dead guys listen don't play dead stay dead what you're doing in your life right now is you are learning how to be alive in Christ how to be fully alive fully alive to all the majesty of God fully alive to all the blessings and promises fully alive to the kingdom in the same way that Jesus was one of my dreams is I want to pay my taxes the same way he did <laughs> right let's go fishing St. Peter fishing first fish you catch open its mouth take out that gold coin and pay your taxes and mine dear Lord Jesus wouldn't that be something I think it's good for us to have a sense of wonder about who we can be who we are in Christ about who we can be and that's part of the anatomy of overcoming that you have a sense of wonder about everything. You have a sense of wonder about who is Jesus in me and who am I becoming in him and how is this situation going to help me? I love the fact that, you know, God goes before us and then he comes with us. Do you ever wonder what God sees when he goes before you? Do we ever wonder that? 
When God goes into that territory ahead of you, what is he seeing? What's he putting down? What resources is he laying out there? He sees every problem and he's probably going to put a promise and a provision right next to that problem. And then he wants to come back and walk with you out into that territory and point out all the good stuff. Here's my question then. If God has gone before you and he goes with you and there's something already out there in your future, what on earth is the point in being worried? Don't you want to go and explore what could be out there? Don't you want to stop bemoaning your circumstances and get excited thinking, I wonder what God has already done about this? A sense of wonder. He's gone before you. He's going to go with you. The kingdom is not a difficult life. The world is a difficult life. But we are in the world, but we're not of it. We're in the kingdom. And in the kingdom, different rules apply. Like to me, like the world is playing checkers and the kingdom's playing chess. The world is playing baseball, the kingdom's playing football. Somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> right? Different rules apply. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and doing signs and wonders and miracles and doing outrageous things. Just all he's doing is showcasing this is how the kingdom works. This is the kingdom you now belong to. This is the territory that you're a part of. And these are the rules. All things are possible. Because God is with you. And God is in you. And so it's appropriate for us to step away from the anxiety and the fearfulness of the earth and step into a place of wonder and expectation and exhilaration about the kingdom of heaven. There's a boldness and a confidence that belongs to you now. It's so important that we step into that place. I love that song that Jonathan wrote, we're no longer slaves to fear. We're children of God. And that's our inheritance. Our inheritance is Jesus. If you want to know what your new man is called, he's called Jesus. Christ in you, the expectation of something astonishing occurring. I wonder what it would be like for us to live in astonishment. You know, one of the last things in the book of Acts is a warning against dullness. To be dull of hearing, dull of thinking. Dullness is where we're too preoccupied with the world to hear the kingdom properly. The kingdom is here to make you astonished, to give you lessons in wonder and astonishment to be shaking your head, to be laughing at things that five years ago you would have been crying over. But you're different now. You've grown up. And there's a different preeminence at work in you that does not countenance worry, doesn't make allowances for fear or negativity. And to know that a, a, a huge part of living in the kingdom is now the enemy has to help us. He doesn't see it that way. But here's the thing. He was created to serve the purposes of God. Nothing has changed. He's still created to serve the purposes of God. If the enemy had known that Jesus being crucified on a tree would take away all of his own power, he would have chopped down every tree in Israel. 
He didn't know that half the stuff he was doing was serving the purpose of God. He doesn't know that by opposing us, he's turning us into warriors. He doesn't get that. He's been too long away from the kingdom. He's lost the ability to think properly. He doesn't know but by opposing us, he makes us greater. But it's important for you to know it. Just saying. There comes a time when the enemy will quit in the face of majesty. And the enemy will be saying, this is the finger of God. I can't do anything here. It's important for us to see how powerless the enemy is in the face of the Lord. There is this relentless desire of God to prosper his people. Read the account of Moses going into Egypt to rescue people that his job was to bring out over a million people and make sure they got paid when they left. And then God was there bringing down every household God in that empire. And between the two of them, they messed up the enemy so bad that he couldn't do anything. And when all the plagues came into Egypt, they never touched Israel once. It never came to them. They were living in Egypt, but it never touched them. There's, some, there's a dynamic here. The thing that blows my mind is this is Old Testament. The New Testament is bigger and it's greater. So if that can happen in the Old Testament, what on earth is our inheritance in the New the scripture says that the new covenant is a better covenant it's a bigger bolder covenant than the old and the old has passed away because the new is here and what we are inheriting is greater than what Israel experienced you are still breathing out there right I'm just checking can you just check your pulse make sure you're alive This covenant, this kingdom that we are a part of, we're going to see greater things than Israel ever saw. And they saw some pretty amazing things, eh? But there's something about this Christ life that's so unique and powerful, so oppressive to the enemy. I long for those days when we're not just defending ourselves, but we are actually oppressing the enemy. And by that, I don't mean people. I mean principalities and powers, all that we read of in Ephesians, when we are oppressing the enemy in the earth. There is this relentless desire of God to prosper the people to do good to us, to provide miracles in the face of oppression. This is what I think we're heading into as a globe. I think we're coming into a time when we're going to get revelation before a battle commences. We're going to have prophetic words given to us before a battle commences. And we know the outcome of that attack before we enter the fight. Because, and the reason for that is because we need to know what the plunder looks like. We need to know how much we get to rob the enemy of things that we're going to need for all that God has called us to do. All the wealth of the wicked is going to come to the righteous. But I think it's going to come through times of difficulty and battle. And we need prophetic words so we can write crafted prayers, so we can stand in a different way. And so we can partner with heaven differently and take resources in the locality that we live.
It's interesting, you know, all this nonsense about health bills and Obamacare, whether you like it or not. Who really cares? I think the real issue is that the government can't afford it anyway, no matter what they choose. But it's tailor-made for the church to develop a healing ministry par excellence. This situation is made for us. It's made for us. All the calamities that the earth will face are made for us. Global warming, it's made for us. Because we know someone who can control the temperature on things. These are made for us to step into places of prayer and bravery and confidence and power. And say, now we can turn the thermostat of the earth down. Now we can do this. Now we can stop that water coming through. We can, we can cause water to come where there is no water. We used to do a lot going through Africa years ago in missions. Go to places where the water supply was poisoned. And you ask the Lord, what, what do you want to do? Because you realize this is our doorway into this community. They don't have drinkable water. If we can solve that, we're in. This is a doorway. This is how evangelism works. And when the Lord said, chop that tree down and throw it in. And so I did that and I prayed and the Lord said, that's great, Graham. Now take a drink. <laughs> Suddenly, you want to bind Jesus, right? <laughs> bind you in, uh, in your name. And so you take a drink and this, this audible gasp. we crazy Englishmen. And then every, everyone watches you for three days. You're like a human Petri dish. Everyone watches you. And on the fourth day when you're still alive and you're drinking the water every day, suddenly everyone realizes this is okay. And the whole area opened up. We went to places where there'd been no rain for like 10, 20, 30 years. And the Lord said, gather all the men and digging equipment. And we ran for a day and a half and he said, stop here, dig there. And we dug down 50 feet. That's a lot of soil to move. And we found water. And then we moved the whole community there. You haven't got to worry about anyone getting saved at that point. People want to know who is this God? And you know that's your job, right? Is to showcase how wonderful Jesus really is. We're not here to showcase our own uncertainty, inadequacy, and fear. Well, I believe Jesus can do it, but I'm not sure if I'm the one to pray for it. Get over yourself. You're exactly the one. This is what we're stepping into. This is what will make us distinctive. Nothing is impossible. You know, every government is going to build a highway straight to your door, right? Because you'll be able to do things that they can't afford to have done in the natural realm. You need a sense of wonder. You need to learn some astonishment. But I tell you, I think you won't survive without a sense of wonder and astonishment. You might get through, but you won't prosper in the difficulty. And you'll fight at a lower level, which might mean you get victories, but it won't mean that you become more than a conqueror. I like reading all the stories in the Old Testament and then realizing 
Those guys did that and they didn't have God living inside them. We're a new creation. All the old things have passed away. You're a new creation. What does that mean? You're a race of people never seen in the earth before Jesus. Because before Jesus, no one had God living inside them. He visited. They had a visitation relationship. They did all those things through visitation. Makes you want to punch yourself in the face. They did all of that through visitation. We are a habitation of God. We have God living in us. We're capable of doing a million times better. Somewhere you get to inherit a sense of wonder and astonishment. If I were you, I'd do it as fast as possible. I think it's important the way we travel is important in the kingdom. The way we travel in the Holy Spirit is important. It's important to travel with a sense of wonder and astonishment. And when we talk to each other, we use that language. It's the language of trust and faith. The language of favor and vengeance. The language of overcoming, of wonder, of astonishment, of awe of worship will come to the days when our prayer meetings will be 55 minutes of worship and 5 minutes of prayer because that's all it will take we get lost in this sense of wonder and our ability to pray build, gets built up and built up and built up until you know that the prayer you're praying is the same prayer that Jesus would pray. And there's only one prayer to pray, and that's the one that he is praying. And so supplication with thanksgiving means you give thanks more than you supplicate, if that's even a word. You give thanks more than you pray. Because you give thanks to get you into that position of awe and wonder and astonishment and presence and majesty. And then the Spirit of God's going to come rising up through people. And just one prayer is going to be prayed. And that's it. Time over. Let's go have a coffee. Let's go wander into Starbucks and do some wandering there. <laughs> 